Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. I am your host, Jason Miles. If you're new to the channel, welcome. Glad to have you here. If you end up liking what you see here, please hit the like button and also hit the subscribe button. If you're a returning viewer or subscriber, fuck yeah. Glad to have you back. I'm talking like this because the AI music that I play on the background to cue me that the intro music is over. It sounds like you've just walked into my tantric den. Which I find oh so appropriate for the topic today. Also, I want to make some quick plugs. I was a guest on the 1001 Album Complaints podcast discussing Slipknot's 1999 debut album. Was it self-titled? I don't remember. I do remember having to listen to that record for that show. Wasn't the biggest fan of that record. Neither were the guys. It's a great, actually, it's a really interesting podcast where they talk about this list of a thousand and one albums you need to listen to before you die. They review these records and talk about why they generally don't like them. Um, but it was a, it was a fun uh, show with, with fellas. I'm going to bring them on this show as well so we can talk about our year in music review. Something that Conan and I take a little more seriously and something we open up the phone lines for. So tomorrow night, we'll be talking about the year 19, is it 78? I totally forgot. <laughs> but tomorrow night, I'll be back with Conan, and I'll totally remember what year it is. I believe it's 1978, because I know Off the Wall is one of the records. Uh, also, I was a guest earlier today on the Woke Bros podcast with Big Waz. That was a lot of fun. He asked me some questions I was not ready for. Also, Waz is a patron, so he asked me some champagne room questions. I was not ready for that. But are you going to be ready for our guest today? And I thought the title for this show was so perfect. Polyamory and Other Musings. I found our guest today not from his writings and esteemed publications or appearances on Big Time Left Podcasts, but a place where I usually don't find much to get excited about. Twitter! Our guest, Tyler Austin Harper, showed up on my radar after he commented on the New Yorker's how to, the how-to guide on polyamory. I had no idea until I searched for his original tweet that I saw that he wrote a piece in The Atlantic about the poly lifestyle and who is reaping the most benefits from his book review of more a memoir of an open marriage this culture would have us believe that interminable self-improvement projects navel gazing and sexual oh god i don't have my glasses so i can't see that far uh are the new face of progress the climate warms wars rage and our country lurches toward a perilous election yes all problems that require real action and progress and somehow you do you has become the american ruling class's three word bible please welcome professor of environmental studies at bates college tyler harper what's up man sorry i botched your quote ah dude you're totally because I, I i i dude i i wear glasses i don't know where i put them my house is not as big as people like to jokingly comment. Um, so Check I found you, I, I found you on Twitter. And the moment I saw your tweet about polyamory, I did what I usually do. I hit up Bert Cooper. Um, and Bert go, oh yeah, I know that guy. Well, I don't really know that guy, but I know that guy. And we had this whole conversation. I was like, well, should I get him on the show? He's like, yeah, 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 you should get him on the show. You should totally get him on the show. Oh, well, tell him I said thanks. He's great. <laughs> I hope I hope he's watching, but I will pass it on. He might not be watching. So uh, tell me how you really feel about the poly lifestyle, brother. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, 
I was sort of at pains to point out in the piece that I, I don't care what people do in the privacy of their own homes. Like I don't have a moral issue with polyamory. I mean, what I was really interested in is this um, rush of media coverage about polyamory over the last couple months. It started as a slow trickle and there's been, you know, stuff on shows like Succession and whatnot in the last couple of years. But in the last few months, it's been everywhere. I mean, The New Yorker, New York Magazine, uh, The New York Times, The Washington Post, Financial Times. Um, and a lot of it's been centered around this book uh, more by Molly Roden Winter, uh, which is kind of sold as this you know, steamy tale of empowerment and this, you know, woman in an open marriage. Um, and uh, New York Magazine ran a whole kind of special issue on polyamory, yeah. partly focused on this book, but also just interviewing other folks. Um, and it was just so overwhelmingly focused on like rich white Brooklynites, you know, um, <laughs> and that I found it just extraordinarily galling that and, and the packaging for this, right, was that this is politics, right? This is like, you know, these people are expressing themselves and, you know, on a personal journey. And it's like political and it's enlightened, blah, blah, blah. And it was really clear that there's nothing at all political about it. Um, and so, you know, I think a lot of people got mad at me because they it took me to be complaining about polyamory in general, which I, I really don't care about. But what I was really interested in is yeah. like why this fixation in the media focused on New York and focused on this book, which is, I will add insane. <laughs> so, <'cause it's>, <laughs> well, <laughs> I will say bananas. people got mad at you because I, apparently you, I didn't think that this was that much of a taboo. And in reading your piece and even reading the, the things you had wrote, you would always like preface your tweet by saying, look, I don't really care what you do i don't have anything against yeah yeah uh, the I really lifestyle don't. like almost every time but it didn't matter you were you were quote tweeted and you know thousands of you know comments and likes and hates later which yeah, yeah, yeah. you know i i found fascinating i even hit up catherine lou about you i was like do you know this guy oh, catherine's <laughs> great i'm a big catherine fan that's awesome <laughs> people went so far as to say that you weren't even black they joe biden you oh dude i get joe biden all the time uh, my favorite one i did a review a couple a uh, couple months ago and someone was like why does a white guy with like why was a white guy with three names asked to write this review uh, <laughs> i actually really like that one some of them are pretty funny like i yeah i mean as long as they're like funny i i think it's great you know but yeah, I get I get uh, Joe Biden a lot. Yeah, that I was I was like, damn, they're Joe Biden and the hell out of this guy, and he didn't even say anything mean. <laughs> I can imagine if he was actually mean. I, I I thought what you had to say on Twitter is, you know, it's the Atlantic. I know you can only go so deep, mm -hmm. but you know, it wasn't just New York socialites you were you were talking about. You were talking about kind of a, a class politics that enables you to have uh, a certain amount of freedom. Mm -hmm. um, in your piece, you talk about something called therapeutic libertarianism. Can you map that out for us? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's what I refer to this idea that I think is really commonplace, um, particularly in kind of, you know, what gets called coastal elite circles, you know, this idea that um, personal growth is the ultimate good, right, that we're all on a journey of self discovery, and that, you know, what we need to do with our lives is self actualize, as it gets called, right. Um, and this is therapeutic in the basic sense that, you know, it starts from the assumption that um, our lives are self improvement projects, and we need to work on ourselves. And that's the ultimate good. Um, and it's libertarian, in the sense that it basically thinks, you know, anything goes as long as, you know, you are realizing your best self. And there's this kind of market logic to it, I think, where, you know, we're supposed to deregulate our desires and um, remove any constraints that, you know, society imposes on us and just grow, 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 you know. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I kind of see the polyamory stuff as basically just an iteration of that kind of, you know, therapeutic libertarianism. I think you said something along the lines of this is kind of the result of maybe you use the term late stage capitalism. Like this is the most kind of obvious maturation that we get with relationships totally. where, you know, as we're, it's harder for us to live single and why not just get a polycule? Yeah. I think what bothers me about, um, the way this has gotten talked about in the media and, and covered on Twitter and so on is exactly that, right? Like it's often um, the enthusiasm for polyamory that you're seeing in these like kind of, you know, elite magazines and circles is often kind of masking problems stemming from inequality, right? So you'll read these articles about how young people are more sexually enlightened and they have multiple partners and they're living all in one house together and blah, blah, blah. And then you like dig deeper and it's like, well, they're all poor and they have no money. And like, that's not to like denigrate 
the yeah. choices they want to make in their romantic lives. That's whatever. But like, it often seems to me that these things are symptoms of the hollowing out of the social safety net, net and like, you know, mm -hmm. wage stagnation and all these and the housing crisis. Right. And like, rather than be like, oh, this seems like a problem. People are like, oh, we'll just let's it's great. The kids are fixing this by living six to a house in their polycule right on, you know, <laughs> fuck the problems away. Yeah, yeah. Fuck the problems away. Exactly. Fuck the problems away. Um, do people call you a conservative? Yeah, I get that. I get that kind of a lot. Um, it's funny, like uh, people that I would consider like properly on the left to definitely do not. And I can tell you that conservatives don't think I'm a conservative like that. I never get mistaken for conservative by conservatives. Um, but yeah, I definitely get that kind of accusation. I mean, um, a friend of mine was talking to somebody in kind of a, a New York you know, media space and was like, I, you know, I read a couple of Tyler's articles and I really like them. It's such a shame. He's a conservative. And this person was like, he's a Marxist. <laughs> like, what are you Jesus. talking about? You know, but I, I do think like there's, um, yeah, I don't know. I think there's a certain, like, if you don't tow a certain kind of like normie progressive line, I think it's really hard for, for people to interpret in any other way is your, you know, some kind of reactionary. What does that say? then about this current iteration i don't want to say iteration this current stage of leftism that we're in in 2024 yeah man i mean i think we're kind of trapped between you know um i try to i mean it's a sloppy distinction but i try to sort of distinguish you know leftism and people who are focused on redistributive economic policies and class problems and then you know progressivism um and the kind of broader kind of identity politics that get wrapped up in that and obviously those things interact in certain ways but i also think they're they're you know separate um and i do think it's you know everything has become really tribal and it's really hard for people to um figure out how to interpret statements or politics that don't hew neatly in a camp you know um and so and particularly if you're like black or if you're of color in some way right like if you're not towing a particular normie progressive line people get uncomfortable really quick and then in, like if you're black what happens is that people accuse you of like either um being a self-hating b like uh deluded or stupid in some way right or c most often that you're like a grifter right like i get accused of uh, you know, being some kind of like anti-woke grifter that's like raking in the dollars all the time. I can assure <laughs> you that if there was somebody who was willing to pay me to be like a Marxist anti-woke person, I would take their money. So if you're out there and you want to pay me for it, please, I will take your Look, we uh, can money find, bags. We, we, we can but, find out yeah. right now. Yeah, I've, I've yet to find that. I don't know. I'm going to, the test is, I have the test. It's behind you. Is that an <laughs> Epiphone 355 or a Gibson 355? It's neither, man. It's a Heritage 535. Oh, and are you yeah. left-handed? No. Okay, that's just the reverse camera yeah. angle. Okay. Yeah. Um, and what kind of amp is that? Uh, it's a Vox AC15. Mm. He could have the big real rig in another room. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I keep everything out back. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm looking, I'm like, camera. okay. I'm looking at the guitars. I'm like, okay, this this could be the deciding factor. All right, he's got them on kind of regular people stands. <laughs> <laughs> They're yeah, not yeah. hanging on the wall. You have to zoom. If they were hanging on the wall, then I would assume you were rich. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he has. I at least have a stud finder. Is what that means. So you know. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Real musicians' guitars hang on the walls, or they're in their road cases. Yeah, yeah. That, that is true. I believe that. There you go. Um. What kind of music do you play? I just want to know now. Now I'm being nosy. Uh, blues mostly. I was really into uh, death metal in high school and like shred guitar. So I was, you know, yeah. that was kind of my scene. Um, and then, you know, after college, uh, it's like uh, just a lot of work to keep up with that kind of thing. And so I got more into blues in the last, I don't know, 10 years after college. I don't play a ton. I used to play a lot. Um, but, you know, I try to get in 20 or 30 minutes a day, but not nothing serious. So I can't send you some of my signature model strings. <laughs> you certainly can, dude. Uh, there you're gonna have to do a neck adjustment there 11 to or it's a 70 73 to 11 oh right on yeah i have um i have a strat back there that i i put 11s on okay but these 70 so it's like a really oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah low e uh we are joined today by another member of the tir crew that was very excited that you were going to be here mean jean bajlan hey greetings fellas howdy man 
How is it going this fine evening? Are you at the Gene, polykill talk yet? You already missed it. Yeah, the I did miss the already happened. Talk. I yeah. was I was I was stuck. I was stuck. You should have told those students to fuck off. You're gonna talk about your make believe life. Yeah. No, I take my teaching job very seriously. He's just saying that because he's on air. Exactly. In his office, it looks like <laughs> I recognize him. Are you at a, in your office? I am in my office. That's true. Yeah. yeah I'm in my um, fine academic office. Fine. Well, Gene, academic. Gene, well, let me ask you, Gene, because you wanted to, to, to sound off about polyamory. Did you read Tyler's piece? I didn't even get a chance to send it to you. You didn't send it to me. So, no, I didn't read that piece. But I did see the Twitter feed. Uh, I did see the Twitter thing that it was based on. So, uh, I can comment. Great. Well, go, go for it. Sound I mean, off. yeah, I uh, like, I think first thing needs to be said I don't care about how people live their lives, right? This is not a moral condemnation of people living in polycules. My grandpa, he had three wives, right? I guess you could call that a polycule, right? <laughs> sure could. A religiously sanctioned polycule, but a polycule nonetheless, right? So that out of the way. So th this is not a condemnation of this way of life. People should be able to live like it and heck i even see some advantages in it you know if you have like a mixed family you could look after kids together that's probably really great and things like that you know i think that's fine uh I, i'm not like totally you know i don't you know might not be for me but if that makes you happy if that's the way that you want to live i think we should be accepting of that and we should be accepting of all kinds of family formations that people want to live in because that's what freedom is all about and i think that's one thing that people on the left you know, I think I hope believe that, you know, people should be free to do this. Um, but it is kind of I think there is kind of an interesting trend taking place where there's been I've seen a couple of articles about like these polycule relations and, you know, the the, the, the dating apps and uh, it's like the fast fashion of love. And <laughs> yeah, that's good. The and um, it's it just feels that we're being told to have disposable relations. It, it seems like there's an alternative morality that is being uh, pushed, as it were. And I find I, I, I'm interested in the political economy, perhaps, uh, behind this thing. We live in a, a world, you know, during the Fordist era, the nuclear family was a critical element of supporting that Fordist system because you had the social reproduction being done by women as unpaid labor, but that was critical labor to allow to have your single breadwinner. When you talk about, you know, having a single breadwinner in the house, you know, that's people tend to think of like, oh, you only have one person working. No, no, you have two people working. It's just you have a division of labor in which you have the domestic work. And, and I think feminism in the 1960s, I'm not an expert on this. You know, there was a big push to look at feminism, uh, look at, you know, uh, uh, you know, f domestic labor, yeah. work as as a, a form of labor. Um, but it seems now in the kind of gig economy, we're being told to have gig relationships. And, uh, you know, <laughs> that's you want to tough. have a, you, yeah, you know, you want to have a, and maybe I'm mixing this up with the kind of uh, the, the sex app thing. But, you know, instead of having these like long term relationships and settling down with roots, you have to be flexible. You have to move that you have to do that in your uh, work life. And now uh, it seems that uh, this idea is being legitimized in, in the public, it, uh, uh, you know, to the public as a reflection of the changing political economy of society where no longer like it's difficult to be a nuclear family now. It's just really hard to be, even if you want to live in a nuclear family, that's just not an option for a lot of people. Now, maybe some people don't want to do that, but maybe some people do. Maybe some men want to be stay-at-home dads with the 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 the, the woman uh, being the you know person working out in the public sphere. Maybe people, some people want to have the man working out in the public sphere and and the woman at home looking after the uh, children. You know, it's not about like who does the work, but the idea that you can have a family unit where one person you know brings in the money you need to survive and the other person does the social reproduction, um, which is a kind of logical division of labor because raising kids is pretty freaking difficult. Uh, it's a full time, it's a ver like a very full time job. 
um, you know, that's just not feasible anymore. So, you know, what's the what's the solution to this? Well, you know, don't have relationship, uh, long term relationships, <clears throat> or you know, fly between polycule and polycule, uh, and uh, you know, don't put down roots. Wow, Gene, I feel like you're talking shit about me. It's fucked up, man. Oh, I, uh, by the way, I'm not going to talk about the incident, but I told Sarah about it, and she's very disappointed in you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, man, dude, I think you're right. I think there's something to that. There's um, a conservative social critic from the 1950s named Robert Nisbet, and he wrote this book called The Quest for Community, which is actually really good. And in that book, one of the things he says is that like, conservatives are always prattling on about the decline of the nuclear family. And they say, like, what's being lost is family values. And he's like, that's nonsense. The reason the family has declined is not because people stopped valuing the family. It's because the political economy changed. And he pointed out that in the 19th century, most a huge percentage of the American American public worked on farms. If you owned a farm, you needed a huge family because a family was free labor, right? So that yeah. led to having these like really big kind of family units that were close knit because that was how you were economically productive. And then, you know, as you know, uh, industrialization happens and then the farm and agrarian work declines and industrial work increases, suddenly it's possible to have smaller family units and still be economically viable, right? And so what masquerades as cultural change is actually just downstream from these material changes. And I think that's, you know, you're absolutely right about like gigification and, and you know, uh, it, it makes a lot of sense as in it's probably no coincidence that at the same moment when it's, you know, we have less uh, workplace stability, more precarity, less geographical stability when we have to move across the country for jobs routinely, that we can't stay in the places we grew up or went to college or whatever, um, that there would arise the popularity of, uh, you know, a form of romance or dating or family organization or whatever that is more plastic, more flexible, et cetera, right? And so, and I think that's my issue with how, um, you know, the media discourse around polyamory has been framed. It's like, it's being positioned as this like rational enlightenment progressive thing when it's like clearly downstream from, you know, various social and economic changes in the last couple of decades. And then also, you know, dating apps, I think are a huge part of this. I mean, you know, I think you pointed out that, you know, um, we're kind of encouraged to see people as fungible and exchangeable and as kind of commodities that we can, um, you know, get infatuated with and then set aside. And I think that whole view is downstream from big tech dating app stuff, you know, and I mean, I think polyamory in a certain way is kind of a logical outgrowth of, you know, the changes brought about by um, in dating by apps over the last two decades. Well, we will be talking about dating apps and our possible addiction to them as there's a class action lawsuit going on. Oh, wow. On that's, Saturday. That's crazy. Saturday, Saturday, Saturday on This Is Revolution. We have a super chat question here and I'm too old to know what this is. Thank you very much, Dizzle McFizzle. What's the panel's opinion on the concept of twink death? Is it real? Is it fake? Discuss. I don't know what that is. Yeah, I don't know what twink death is. Man, I'm not I'm not cool or young enough anymore. I, I, no I don't is. I'm I'm afraid to even try to guess what it is. Are you looking it up, Gene? I'm looking it up on my work computer. Oh, that does not sound like <laughs> wise. Oh, twink death. Uh, loss of yeah, twink safety's gonna youthful, pop in. youthful appearance as a result of aging. Oh, so it's not a, okay. Hmm. My mind was somewhere else. <laughs> Can you repeat it I one mean, more time? Yes, I think uh, people get older. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so what is it now, Gene? I think I think it's just a new way of saying you're getting old. Oh, that's it? it has yeah. nothing to do with a loss what? of a twink's youthful appearance as a result of aging. Just twinks in general? I the think the category twinks or just people? I think it just is I think it's the category of twinks. Okay, so it's when oh that Were you ever a twink? Or logic chop this. <laughs> Were you ever a twink? Any of you guys? Yeah. No, no, I don't I don't so. can, can black people be twinks? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do they have black twinks out there? You thought it was reserved for you, you Google Asian that too, man. I'm sure you can find I'm it. I'm not Googling that on my <laughs> computer. <laughs> You'll get a visit from IT. <laughs> I to HR and IT. All the time. HR, IT, campus DEI security. comes in. <laughs> yeah, D, D, I'll get DEI'd. <laughs> 
absolutely. I have to go to a lot of twink sensitivity training. That is not where I get yelled at by by a woke Karen. You know, it's like you have two types of Karen. You have Taylor Lorenz, or you have libs of TikTok. Yeah, yeah, you do. One of those will get you. No, I never go into incognito mode. Come on. (laughs) The chat's asking me if I go into incognito mode. Keep everything out in the open. Main browser on the work computer. Main browser. It's like I'm well, doing let me, research. Let, let me ask both of you guys this. Um, I, I'm, you probably don't see this as much, Gene, because you're no longer dating. So you only talk to... Well, maybe your students do this to you. Um, in, your speech, in, your piece, in your piece, you speak uh, a bit to the prevalence of therapy language. Mm-hmm. Something that's in the, the lexicon of everyday speak now. Um, what is your take on the on like all this therapy language and everyday speak? Everything is triggering. Everything yeah. I don't like is trauma. Yeah, man, I think it's everywhere. I I will say I don't. Um, I think this gets blamed on like young people a lot and like Gen Z and there are snowflakes and blah blah blah. I I generally don't find that to be true. Most of my students and young people I encounter are, are fine. Um, I think it's really like kind of my generation and older that is the problem with most most uh, most things. Um, but yeah, I do think you know therapy speak is everywhere. I mean. Um, I really think we're in the middle of a kind of new, new age movement, right? That we're repeating a lot of the stuff from the 1970s. Um, and I think, you know, the alternative lifestyles are coming back, you know, communes and polyamory crystals. Exactly. (laughs) But I mean, even anti-racism, I think should be, you know, in DEI stuff, I think is, we should understand it as a new, new age movement. I mean, in the, you know, original DEI HR stuff came out of the seventies and eighties and it was very similar and it was focused on personal transformation through difficult encounters and growth. And you, there would be, you know, these staged encounters and conflicts between black and white coworkers so that you could work out, you know, you'd have these conflagrations and then you would grow out of them. Right. And we're seeing a lot of that right now where we all have to look inward and dig deep and do the work and blah, blah, blah. And it's, I mean, this focus on sort of inward spiritual revolution, which is what a lot of DEI promises, even if it pays lip service to racial capitalism, it it really doesn't seem to believe in it. Um, Yeah. I mean, I think it's all new age stuff and it's all drenched in therapy speak. You know, I, I all, all see it as part of this, you know, therapeutic turn inward that suffuses so many of things that, you know, we're told are supposed to be radical, whether it's polyamory or, HR and DEI or whatever. Gene. I mean, I mean, I would, I, I, I would agree with that. I, I guess I, I frame it slightly different, and perhaps that's because I live in the buckle of the Bible Belt. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, I guess the way that I would see it is like, you've had, you know, historically, you had in the 19th century the emergence of bourgeois Christianity, mm-hmm. and uh, a kind of set of morality that dictated social norms in the emerging sort of uh, capitalist world of the United States, you know, it's not your, it's, this is not pre-modern Christianity we're dealing with here in the United States. We're dealing with something that's fundamentally modern. So, you know, uh, and as a kind of, I guess, as a digression, you know, in the pre-modern era, religion was a fact of life. You know, it was, it it was, it, it was how you understood the world. It was the world you lived in. You lived in a world of magic. But with the, the disenchanting of, of the world, religion becomes, you know, a, a kind of it becomes a functional set of morality. That's not unique to the Christian world. That's that's the Islamic world is 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 is, is similar to that. The example I know, I assume India and other parts of the world have similar trends in terms of spirituality. And 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 the way that I see kind of let's say. Uh, for want of a better word, and I don't like the word woke, but this woke stuff like the DEI, critical race theory uh, complex, I see that as uh, an alternative set of bourgeois morality. So you have, you know, you, you have two forms of progressivism almost. You have the reactionary conservative progressivism, which wants to utilize the state to impose one certain set of morality on people. And then you have uh, you know, liberal progressivism, which has a different set of mores and mora- mor- morals, which are not necessarily religiously sanctified, uh, but are almost metaphysical in the way that they approach society. You know, you have, um, you, you know, you have like these, you, uh, and, and, you know, Ture Reid has talked about this before. Mm-hmm. You have this kind of Acknowledgement that race is a uh, constructed category, but functionally, you have, you know, these things as being treated 
as innate categories uh, of people. So kind of like a, 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 a trick of the wrist, as it were, you know, like saying like, oh, it's constructed, but then acting as if it's, you know, innate and determined. So, you know, I see, I, I guess I would see the whole DEI thing as the ideology of a new emergent sort of multicultural, uh, you know, multi-ethnic uh, uh, governing class. I mean, even with the kind of 1619 project, which is framed as a critique of, uh, you know, the American national, national narrative, the way I see it is actually uh, not as a critique of American nationalism, but as an alternative nationalist narrative, which places the black professional managerial class at the center of that historical narrative. So, you know, there's a great book by my old professor, uh, John Hutchinson, uh, who called Nations as Zones of Conflict. When we look at, you know, when we look at uh, nationalism, we often see it as like one nation versus another nation, but often very deep conflicts are conflicts over what it means to be part of the ostensibly same nation. And what we're seeing here in the United States, you know, these two alternative visions of what the United States is, a liberal progressive and a conservative progressive. And, and I know that sounds contradictory, but the reason I say progressive is because both sides in this, uh, in this uh, conflict want to utilize the state to impose their fav favored set of morality on people. Now, as a side point, there are certain things that the liberals are right on, you know, like we should like we should be accepting of different ways of life. We should be accepting of uh, different gender identity, of different cultures and things like that. But the problem comes in is the way that uh, this is imposed. Uh, you know, I, I did it. You know, I fired off a tweet the other day uh, about like everybody, you know, the, the only people I ever see getting mad about cultural appropriation uh, professional managerial types, right? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, people of color, the very same people who like to like ventriloquize the global majority, right. Um, for the white people. And then you kind of woke Karens who are like, you should give you an example. My, my wife did a, my wife on faith, my wife on, uh, <laughs> did a post one time. And, uh, uh on the post, she had a, a fist, you know, I can't remember what even, and then somebody was like, that's cultural appropriation. I was like, do you fucking think black oh, people no. in the United States are the only people who raise their fucking fists? Wow. That's awesome. like, My wife is Iranian. What do you think they were doing in 1979? They were fisting everybody. That's so good. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah Bajlan, yeah. the fister. The fister. So, 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 so I, I see it as a conflict over, to use a Bidenism, the soul of America. <laughs> totally. Okay. Wow. Absolutely right. Well, I want to, you know, let, let me ask you guys this. We're talking about cultural appropriation. I was having a conversation uh, earlier today. Uh, Big Waz wanted me to weigh in. Oh, wait that. one second. Stop calling me a trot. Everybody's always calling me a trot. I'm tired of it. Oh, I, well, first of all, I think it was a joke. We're going to have to tell you to calm down a little bit. You can't come on here if you've been having Coming all the caffeine. Hot, Coming in hot. <laughs> Like, Jesus Christ, I don't know what's going on in the faculty lounge, but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you might be two rails in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I'm in Missouri. There's no alcohol. Faculty lounge like mirror. <laughs> you said there's a lot of alcohol? Oh, you no, doing... you're not allowed. You have to get, per... I think you have to get permission from the president's office to bring alcohol onto campus, which is bizarre because in England, like, I used to get hammered. I used to go for, they used to have wine receptions all over the University of London. You get, you, you wouldn't have to buy a drink if you knew where the right wine, departmental wine reception was. Oh, that's crazy, man. Yeah. Uh, We're not so strict. <laughs> if my employer's listening, my office is not full of booze or cocaine, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, like, I, I've never been told not to fill it with booze or cocaine, you know? It's not Gene's office, is what you're saying. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, Gene, I don't think you've seen American Fiction, but uh, Tyler, you've seen American Fiction. Yeah. Um, that is a movie where literally characters uh, in real life in the book are exchanged for white people. Black characters are exchanged for white people. Why don't we call that cultural appropriation? And how did you feel about American Fiction, Tyler? Yeah, I really liked American Fiction. And I think, um, you know, the things that people didn't like about it, I tended to think were on purpose, you know, like whether it was the... Um, 
the way the like family narrative, you know, so you know, as you know, American fiction kind of juxtaposes a, a family drama to this, you know, craziness around the publishing industry and their weird race fetishizations and so on. Um, and, you know, people didn't like the way the family drama got dropped in favor of, the, you know, the race parody or whatever. But, you know, I, I tended to think most of those kind of things were um, kind of part of the point. But I thought it was great. I mean, you know, I think a lot of people thought it could have been harder on the publishing industry and in that it allowed um, kind of like good white liberals and media elites to remain in on the joke. Like it didn't make them uncomfortable yeah. enough. Like they were able to like recognize themselves in it and, and like laugh, you know, good naturedly yeah. about it. But like still like it was kind of for them in a way. Um, but, you know, I don't I don't know how these people think the movie could have been made otherwise in the way that it was made. You know, like that's part of the point is that it's like really hard to make you know, black art or, or, you know, do black discourse that doesn't in some way always end up uh, like catering in one way or another to, you know, the people who are paying for the movies, which are largely not black people. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I thought it was great. But, but this movie had black producers. Yeah, no, it did. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, Bo Boots Riley, I think, is a perfect example of someone that can make very interesting art with, I guess we'll call it black art. He's a black man. Yeah. Um, and I don't really feel like he has to sacrifice much for it. They're definitely, definitely smaller films in scope. And he doesn't have the production names behind him of note, right? There's no Lee Daniels making Sorry to Bother You or I'm a Virgo. There's no Oprah Winfrey behind him. There's no Tyler Perry behind him. Yeah. Issa Rae isn't behind him. You know, for me, Issa Rae was able to use her character, which in the book is very small. Yeah. And not portrayed and, as favorably at all. You know, she she uses her character as almost a redemption arc for herself. Um, because she is that person that went to a good college, lived in a good area, and didn't really grow up around riffraff. And that whole scene where she's like, well, I was... Well, she interviewed her cousins or something like that for three yeah. days. And that was like all the blackness she needed. Um when we talk about, you know, Gene, we brought the whole cultural appropriation of people that love to use the term uh, culture vulture, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, it does feel like it's these, you know, the Issa Rays of the world. You know, Burt Cooper wrote a piece, I think it was his first big piece, you know, who gets to write for poor black yeah, people. And current affairs. And, right? and it is these people. And that's kind of how I, I walked away from American fiction and it felt to me like mm, this could have been a more teeth. TV movie. Well, again, because if I didn't know Boots mm -hmm. and if I didn't see him, I wouldn't, you know, kind of almost say struggle, but pitch his idea, which sounded like a crazy idea from Jump. Like, I'm going to make a movie about a call center. Mm -hmm. Like, who the fuck wants to see that? Like, if someone told you that, I don't care who it is. Yeah, yeah, 100%. You know, they told you that. You'd be like, what? What the fuck? Yeah. Yeah, if you found out Scorsese's next movie was about a call center, you'd be like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> but <clears throat> Gene, you've seen Sorry to Bother You, right? Yeah. yeah. Did you dig it? Yeah, I thought it was a I, I thought it was a very uh astute movie, to be honest. I mean, I think the 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 bit that remains with me actually from that movie the most is when he's going on the TV and he's yelling about everything, yeah. and everyone's like at a boy in him and like damn damn right, you're on it, you know, well done. And they're just not listening to the message. And he's yelling and yelling and yelling, and it's all just been reincorporated into entertainment. And I and and that was the part that you know really struck me the most because it was yeah like you can actually have people saying pretty radical things, mm -hmm. but they get completely muted in the noise of the media sphere, right? Mm -hmm. I mean we we dog on we dog on Ibram X Kendi all the time. But like Ibram X Kendi will go and like bitch about capitalism and, and everyone will be like, yeah, well done, Ibram X Kendi. And the next thing you know, he's like, but, you know, buggering off with loads of money from um, $532 a minute for a Zoom call. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, can it's we? Like those, that... It's like those two women who did the like race to dinner or whatever it was. The, the, uh, the... That was amazing. Those <laughs> two black women that, was, that were just that yelling at white people. That, was like the fact that there were high caste, there was that high caste Hindu lady who got yeah. in on the grift as well. It's amazing. You got to really respect the high caste. Well, hey, I, check this out. And Eugene's bringing up a good point. And once you let them in, it's a wrap for you, black ladies, because they have <laughs> no time for your white supremacy bullshit. Don't let them in your club. 
No, no, no. Once you do, all that fucking goodwill you got. You think you can yell at her like you do to white women? No. I wish I think we played a clip of that in the champagne room. If not, I think I sent it to to the TIR group. Did you have you seen that clip, Tyler? You know what he's talking no. about? No, no, no. I mean, I know about the dinner thing, but no, I haven't seen the clip. These two black was it two black women or two no, black women, it, an Indian lady? It's uh it's it's a black woman and a woman called Samira Rao. Okay. Who were just like getting rich suburban white women to pay them money for the for the absolution. It's like a just, it's like an indulgence, isn't it? You pay them the money. You pay the you pay the money to the uh the to the uh, church of D, DEI, and you get you get an absolution for being a racist. But you have to go back every so often, pay your money to make sure you're not. You got to re up, yeah. You got to re up exactly oh, because no, you know, no. like this whole DEI stuff, everyone has to be racist forever because that's the end game, isn't it? Like, totally, what happens yeah. when we solve racism? What's going to happen to all the DEI stuff if you solve racism? You can never that that dinner is proof that you're never going to solve racism because everything these women said was racist. <laughs> so everything racist. Yeah, it was like uh, what did she say? She like complimented one of the women on something, and it wasn't even one of those compliments that you expect a stereotypical older white woman to say. Like, I yeah. love your hair, Shane. Yeah, right. Yeah, like, it wasn't even I something like that. And uh, she just what did see? That's what I'm talking about. Every time you compliment me like that, you're condescending, and I was like. Oh God, you're a nightmare, dude. It's so good. I mean, oh, I like so not. much of this stuff oh, is so you. impressive, just from a grift standpoint. I wrote an article uh, for the New York Times this summer about like parent, like anti-racist parenting stuff. Um, and there are like, <laughs> there are whole fucking coaches, dude. Like I shit you not, coaches, like anti-racist parenting coaches that will like go to these white women's house and just like tell them like, ah, this is like how you get a racist kid. You're you know like you gotta get out these dolls and you gotta do this and yeah, man, it's it's like nuts. There's like a whole how did that work industry. out for this? How did that work out for the satanic panic? Right, we're just getting the anatomically correct dolls. What happened? <laughs> I don't know. What's that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, it's exactly. It's like restaging the satanic panic, except <laughs> Satan is like you know, I don't it, know. It racism. Feels, it feels the same way because it feels to me like these two movies. I can't remember the name of the movie for Elizabeth Wilkerson's uh, cast. You know, Ava DuVernay is making a movie for for her as well. Mm. But the gravitas that we saw in 2020. Um, with a lot of these movies and all the, you know, Ford Motors with, in this time of need wants to let you know we don't mind if Negroes drive our cars. Wait, dude, I'm sorry prefer- to interrupt you, but have you seen the Ford commercial that came out in like 2020? It's like yep. in a basement and it's like, but like the basement's also a hair salon and it's just like only <laughs> black people. And then it's Is like this the commercial with the, with the, for Ford. The, the gold chain, one of the, the Black Lives Matter chicks wearing a gold chain. Is that the one? No, no, this is a different one. And it was like, we're to this month, we're celebrating black Ford employees. And it's like, this commercial was produced exclusively by black employees, but it's like in this b- basement, but the basement is also like a hair salon. But then there's also inexplicably like a basketball and like a car with rims. And it's just a, like, oh a, it's like chat GPT threw up like a white person's imagination, <sighs> of like what black people are like. It's, it's like absolutely bananas, but yeah, it's all to sell, you know, anti-racist uh, Ford F-150s. I guess. I, I- I, I mean, and that's why we end up with the Jessica Krugs of the world, which I can never find where, what's happened to Jessica Krug. But like you have all this like, like, I'll, you know, give you a good example. Uh, you know, my academic specialty is the least interesting to most people, which is the history of the Kurdish community. And for literally most of the modern era, the main objective of the Kurdish intelligentsia was to prove that they were true Aryans and part of the white race. However, in the last 20 years, like there's this like big shift in Kurdish acad- amongst Kurdish academics to present Kurds as people of color, indigenous people, and like, you know, calling them, I'm like, for God's sake, man, like if your name was not Zahra, you know, <laughs> you'd pass as a freaking Italian, no problem, you know, you know. I'm pretty. I get called a Mexican occasionally. People speak to me in Spanish at the airport. But um, come on, man. Most <laughs> Middle Eastern people are kind of white, right? Um, uh, but because yeah. of this orientation in academia, there is like a real big kind of push to adopt a lot of this language. 
uh, uh, of indigenous, uh, you know, being indigenous, mm -hmm. of being people of color, being part of the global majority, which I don't think makes any sense to talk about the global majority because then white people are the minority, right? Was that uh, you that told me the thing about the global majority? Like you no longer say minority. You have yeah, to you don't say to... people tell you say global majority. Yeah, no people. Are, oh, did yeah. you know that, Tyler? Have you, you yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always global. like find out these things way later than everyone else. Like I was on the academic job market when I found out what BIPOC meant. I had like I had no fucking clue, and they're like, oh, like a, a bi. Meant. You want to buy BIPOC? And it's just like, what the fuck is that? It's like, why do bisexual people of color need their own little? <laughs> yeah, like hundred <laughs> percent. Dude, for the longest know. time, for yeah, the longest yeah, yeah. time, because I, I remember yeah, that's Doug honestly Lane. what I assumed. I totally agreed. Yeah. I had no clue what it was. I uh, yeah, it uh, sounds like a fucking illness. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, so much of it just pop. comes down Ooh. to the normative <laughs> inversion of white supremacy, right? It's like you just you just uh, invert white supremacy. You don't reject it. You just oh, totally. like flip it on its head. And say, like, now all the white stuff is bad. And the problem with that is, like, again, I think the historical injustices and the inequalities that are born out of the fact that, you know, Native Americans were genocided and black people were enslaved, you know, those have to be dealt with concretely through real measures. But a lot of this shit just seems to be, like, uh, benefiting a very small elite of people who are already the intermediary class uh, of the, uh, you know... Uh, you know, intermediary class, and they just want to they just want a slice of that elite pie, right? Totally. And it doesn't actually concretely deal with the, um, you know, do doesn't deal with any of these these uh, issues. We still have all these inequalities. We still have this, uh, you know, racialized society large number of poor people and it just reifies these identities right which makes no which makes no sense to me right it it it, it, it um you know it and i think more importantly and i think you raised this jason getting the white people to think of themselves as white people all the time mm -hmm. is probably not going to end really well right no it's like a it's like uh it's like you know for 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 centuries, there was this like active attempt to co cultivate a white identity being driven by white political elites. But now we have people of color, perhaps inadvertently, doing the same thing and construct reconstructing whiteness. And yes, they're trying to reconstruct it in a negative light. But at some point, people are going to like, well, fuck this. You know what I mean? Totally. And they're just going to embrace it. So I think I think ultimately... Not only is it stupid, it's it's actually feeds in to what might emerge as a resurgence of white supremacy. I totally agree, man. I work on um, the history of human extinction, but I do a lot of stuff with the history of science, and uh, a lot of my works on nineteenth-century eugenics. And I'm always struck by like how many similarities there are between like supposed anti-racism and then like eugenics and like whacked-out race science shit. Um, when I was w writing that thing about um, anti-racist parenting, I was reading all these like anti-racist parenting books, and one of them, I shit you not, had this like whole color guide that was like about micro shades of brown and teaching your child to identify them. And it was like, this kind of black person is pine cone brown. This kind of person Whoa. is like red, ruddy clay red. This kind of person is like, you know, walnut brown. It's like, what the fuck? Like the only people who think about like skin color and these gradations in this way and obsess over them are either crazy anti-racist people or literally literal Nazis, you know? Um, and I, yeah. Or shitty I, black people like me that just like to talk shit. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Um, but yeah, man, I don't know. I think you're right. Like you this pine cone motherfucker. <laughs> They're rebranding the high yellows. Uh, <laughs> you pine cone brown ass. I mean, it's 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 super bizarre. Uh, it, it's it so is, strange, it is, man. It, it's I mean, like uh, you know, I oft, I view a lot of this stuff through the lens of nationalism theory uh, uh, as opposed to race theory. And you know, Eric Hobsbawm has a really good line about it, where he says, you know. Uh, nations don't make nationalisms and nation states. National uh, nationalisms and nation states make nations. But I think what I like to always add to it. But sometimes they make the wrong nation, right? <laughs> sometimes they end up like making a group, start to see themselves as a group and act as a group uh, by accident, by discriminat discriminatory uh, policies. You know, whether that's on racial grounds, on the color of your skin, on your sectarian. 
uh, affiliation or your language and things like that. So, you know, I think, I, I think, um, you know, a lot of this anti-racism stuff is a reification, is just a re-reification of racial categories. And because the United States is so important in world affairs, um, those categories begin to be exported to other parts of the world where they totally don't make any sense. I mean, what a colleague of mine um, uh, told me, uh, you know, told me she'd been to a presentation uh, where they were talking about the history of relations between China and Africa in the 1960s and 70s. And not once did they discuss the issue of race. Why? I mean, obviously race is important in that relationship, <laughs> but because they couldn't conceive of race uh, as not being between white people and people of color. Uh, they couldn't conceive of the fact that, like, you know, perhaps other groups would have, you know, have, have similar prejudices. You'll have similar. Uh, I mean, you just go on South African TikTok and uh, watch black people take make fun of uh, South Asians. And, uh, and and you'll see like these th things exist in a lot of different societies. You know, in the Middle East, we don't need right. We don't need color racism to machete each other to death. We can do it over, you know which sub branch of Islam you're on you know, forget about the Christians you know we can we can we can get we can get angry about that or which indo-iranian dialect you speak you know solid point Jean Bajlan Tyler do you have anything to add to that no man I think I totally agree that we just you know um I mean, race matters and you like we have to think about it and reckon with it. But I think like doubling down and essentializing it in these bizarre ways, particularly as we're constantly being told that like race is a social construction and race isn't real and blah, blah, blah. And yet um, the same people who are saying that really don't behave as though that's true, you know, and I yeah, I, I, I just I cannot agree enough with the point that it's like probably not good to get all of these white people thinking of themselves as white people, like as a like, a you know, that as a political category, that seems bad. I don't know. And that seems like the train we're on. I'm not. <laughs> You know, it will I mean, right Cuba, now. It's, it's a winning. Cuba, Cuba has a story he's told on this show a couple of times, which I think is worth repeating. Mm -hmm. Cuba is our uh, Polish Canadian uh, Confederate, and he said, you know, one time he had a job, and that you know, at the end of the job, this a Midwestern guy with a German surname took him aside and said, you know, basically tried to do the whole, we us whiteies have got to stick together against the blacks, and Cuba just looked and just was thinking like. My bro, you lich, your ans your German ancestors came into Poland and freaking built concentration camps in my country, and, and you want me to have solidarity with you against what did black people ever do to the Poland? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Gene, there are a lot of compliments about your camera, by the way. What's up with my camera? No, they said compliments. Yeah, it is a very good camera. I was actually yeah. thinking that. I saw one of the yeah. comments and I was like, oh, that, yeah, that yeah, they're, they're saying your picture is, is on the next level. So whatever you're doing, you got to keep doing it. I mean, it's just my Logitech camera. It's the same camera, camera I use every time. Look, Maybe, at, look at that. Look at that plug. That's how you that's how you do a good plug. Yeah. Logitech, if you're out there, you can sponsor me. It's just my Logitech camera. Yeah. Gene Bajlan sponsored by Logitech. <laughs> Gene Bajlan brought to you by. I feel like, uh, uh, Tyler, I feel like it's the last gasp of the black PMC as a lot of that George Floyd money is is finally coming to an end. Totally. And that moment is over. Yep. Where, you know, we're going to take these issues that you people have real seriously. And in only four years, we've gone from we're going to listen to these complaints. We're going to defund this. We're going to change these laws. We're going to have bail free. We went from in four years to that to, well, when you don't have enough cops, um, these Negroes is breaking into stores all the time. And, and you know, where I'm from in the San Francisco Bay Area, the Macy's. I just saw that. They shut down the Macy's. Yeah. Shutting down the Macy's has been there for almost 100 years. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone's blaming robberies my last i was in san francisco not you know, a few months ago and i saw no strong arm robberies <laughs> it was it was fine Survive. actually yeah yeah I, I got my son a toy for macy's it was totally fine um but, but it was empty but it, it only took four years for that to change yep. and i think there's a fear in the black pmc that like oh shit that it, like it's almost like they thought that 
waterfall of of cash and relevance was forever yeah totally completely like it was the 90s it's like nah dude the two the 2000 the, the 2020s is a whole different ball of wax and you don't have these long Runway. decades long period yeah to to you know do what you want to do like the, this isn't the 90s where you can have you know 10 years of of uh, underclass ideology cinema <laughs> yeah <laughs> dude man i think you're totally right and i think the thing that um I mean, even like, at, you know, among the black PMC and academia, it's like shit hasn't got better. Like all this money flooded in to like create centers and projects and everything else. Academia is on fire. We have less tenure track faculty than ever. Everyone is employed as basically a gig labor professor, you know, and an adjunct without health care and like all of the like equity <laughs> money that got thrown at academia and shit hasn't got better for anyone. It's, it's worse. It's so much worse than in 2020. And we threw all this money at supposed justice. I don't, oh, I don't know, man. I mean, this is, this, this, this hits me. the point when they built that, you know, the, the there was the, uh, the, the journalism Ken's center. There was the journalism center that they mm. created at Howard University mm. with, uh, what's her name? Oh, Nicole. Nicole, 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 Nicole Hannah Jones. Yeah. But um, I thought you were talking about the Kendi Snake Oil Center at Boston University. Not the Kendi Snake <laughs> Oil, but the journalism center. Uh, what's uh, Nicole the Hannah 15, Jones? 19 project? Nicole right? Hannah Jones. Yeah, Nicole yeah. Hannah Jones set up yeah. that thing. You know, that's all great, but what if there's no jobs in journalism? What are you training these people for? Right. Totally. You know, that's the fundamental problem of the political economy of academia. You and you and and you know totally the, the problems are structural. For example, in the discipline of history, you know, I, I had a look today, there's roughly around 150 PhD programs producing like eight thousand PhDs uh, you know, a year. And there aren't jobs to absorb them. And academia is talking, you know, elite academia is talking about like, oh, out academic jobs, like this, that, and the other. It's like, no, the solution is shut down those PhD programs and redivert that funding to MA programs, which are usually you can't get funding for an MA, but that's where the need is because we need educated social studies teachers. Yep. We need to be, we need to be restructuring our, our entire discipline to 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 you know uh, to put it in a a place that's more secure but people like to have all these P, uh, phd students to do their jobs for them right dude it's free labor this shit it's kills free me labor. Right? like because we're... if you didn't have the phd students who's going to teach the classes i frankly think motherfuckers need to do their jobs Dude, it's insane, man. My so I uh, my PhD is in comparative literature. The year I went up, on the, so we took my PhD program took like eight to ten people a year. The day uh, the year I went up, in the whole country there were three jobs, three tenure track jobs in comparative literature in the whole country. My program was graduating eight a year for three Damn. jobs in the country, right? And every <laughs> complete PhD program was doing the same thing, right? And if you ask yourself, like, why, well, why, if there aren't any jobs, why are we graduating all these people? It's basically for that reason. There's like essentially TAs and graduate students are basically sl wage slaves for, you know, tenure track professors. So they can teach an hour once a week and then all the TAs can do all their work. And then there are all these other structural problems in academia, like um, the size of your program often determines how much funding your department can get. So if you take less PhD students, they give you less money for research. And then eventually you just shrink and shrink and shrink and your, you know, your budget implodes and then you're done. Right. So, I mean, there are all these like labor exploitation problems baked into academia and then everyone is you know we're all asked to pretend that it's this like hotbed of justice i mean it's it absolutely you know just drives me insane it's feudalism and it's it's collapsing one it's of my total colleagues, feudalism yeah my my colleagues one of my colleagues made a good point about a academics now it's like you still you know if you're a tenure track person even if you, even if you're a tenure track per, uh, person uh, you know the whole system is collapsing and you might have the social prestige of being a professor, but it's like being a samurai, but in 1840. Like, yeah, you have social <laughs> prestige, but you still have to make umbrellas on the weekend to make ends meet. It's really, you know, it, I mean, it really kind of sucks. I mean, a lot of, a lot of the time when pe people, you know, people come up to me and say, hey, I want to do a history PhD. I'm like, no, right? Don't mm -hmm. do a history PhD. I say you the know, same thing. Yeah. Unless you are going to go to one of the top, top universities and get fully funded, you might as well, you know, I, you know, I frank, like it's immoral, like the, that, like some universities have 
PhD programs when they know that their graduates are like very unlikely to get jobs. So the problem is not, you know, DEI is not the freaking, diversity is not the problem in academia. The problem is that the whole structure is skewed to an archaic, uh, you know, it's made for a world that doesn't exist anymore. And, you know, we can pretend that doesn't happen. Like the, the American Historical Association loves to pretend like it's all about like, it's like, I'm sorry, you don't need 10 years of graduate work to be a high school teacher, right? In fact, you know, from an economic standpoint, you're probably going to retire with the same amount of pension because you've had 10 years more of putting into your pension as a high school teacher as you are at a university professor. That money, you know, academia needs to engage more with society. And engaging with society to a lot of academics is going on MSNBC and being John Meacham when engaging with society should really be integrating universities with the high school system, bringing in teachers so that they're, instead of us as academics looking at them as kind of inferior to us, but seeing them as colleagues that we work with to improve, you know, to improve, create an educated public. But people don't want to do that. Like you say, uh, it's not just administrators who want the free labor. It's the, it's the tenure track professors. And I blame, you know, I, like the worst ones are the Gen X academics, and I'll tell you why. Like the boomer academics were kind of assholes, but they were like real scholars back in the day. Yeah, but yeah. the Gen X academics, right? I see those ones really as being the ones behind this DEI stuff and the ones who are like simultaneously pampered like the like the boomers, but uh, but like don't have the academic chops of the boomers. Dude, yeah, yeah. Oh, like I am convinced, I joke with my buddy about this all the time, that like the, you know, the push to be like, oh, well, like, you know, we're diversifying the curriculum and we're, you know, everything before 1985 is like racist. So we're getting rid of it. It's just because those motherfuckers don't want to read, right? They don't know anything. And yeah, they don't have the the scholarly chops. I, they want to shrink uh, the curriculum to the past 20 years. But no, man, I agree. And I think that's why DEI is so frustrating and performative and, and so insane, right? Like the reason it's insane is that the problems in academia can't be fixed because the problems are the financial model. So like the real equity issues and the real diversity issues are things like tuition keeps increasing because the universities are over way over leveraged with the real estate holdings. And the real problems are that, you know, universities rely on the diversity for mostly people of color from the, you know, top 20% of the income brackets of their respective demographics and so on. Right. Um, and that's the financial model, but you can't fix that, right? The universities aren't going to lower their tuition and they're not going to give more scholarships and they're not going to touch their endowment. So if they can't fix any of the real equity issues, all they can do is like huff and puff and distract and, you know, hold workshops about microaggressions and how to talk about one another's hair and so on, you know? Um, yeah, I don't know, but, but you're right. It's like a collapsing system and, you know, the problems that need fixed can't be fixed because they're literally the, the financial model of the university. Do students ever say like, if something like that happens or someone makes a comment about hair and someone gets upset about it, does the student ever say like, we're not going to talk about this? Um, my, uh, you know, I, I'd be interested in what you think my students are like, I find them so much more reasonable than people of my generation. Like if somebody gets misgendered or if there's like a comment that like comes across the wrong way, they're really and this isn't, I don't think just my students, like other young people I encounter out in the world are also very much like this. By young, I mean like under 25, where they're like, oh, my pronouns are actually this. Or, you know, actually, I, I don't prefer ABC thing you just said, you know, but like not in the kind of like hectoring, shrieking um, kind of Fox News caricature that we're like led to believe. You know, I, I recognize that in like I'm a 32. I recognize that people in my, like that's behavior I recognize from people in my age cohort, actually. But yeah, I mean, my students are, are um, not like, like that at all they're they're reasonable they're a lot more like um you know to use the word woke than me in a lot of issues but they you know they'll listen to counter arguments respectfully they you know are yeah they'll they'll change their mind if you know you present them with new evidence yeah i find the young people pretty okay i mean i teach in a like a relatively poor part of missouri at a state school which is a relatively big state school uh you know it's a, a step above a directional but it's not the flagship university. A lot of first generation students here. Uh, what I see is a lot of kids who work in two jobs to make ends meet, to try and like reduce the debt load that they come out of university with, who are really often too tired from work to engage with issues. And 
you know, again, like you say, they're reasonable. You know, like be, I, like this whole mythology of the the Gen Z being like this, that Gen Z is like that. It's like they aren't like that culturally different from, from millennials in many ways. They just have TikTok, you know. <laughs> totally. Uh, Worst yeah, humor. and it's uh, they have like there's, there's there's like different slang words, but I don't I don't see and in some ways like they're more socially conservative than uh, than uh, um, uh, millennials. You know, I, I kind of think the heyday of kind of uh, sexual moral depravity is probably like 1995 to 2005. And after that, uh, uh, you know, people, there's a kind of reaction against that. Uh, so I think the, you know, I think a lot of this stuff, uh, you know, this kind of generational discourse, it like happens with every generation and it's a bit silly, but I think the, you know, the real issues for, for like most young people aren't like, microaggressions and stuff like that. It's like the poor kids have, you know, uh, like trying to navigate uh, a, a world where they're terrified. I mean, like you gotta, you gotta take into account that a lot of the kids that are coming into the universities now, like they were little kiddies when their parents lost their houses in 2008, 2009. And they've been like traumatized by that. And then the ones now coming in, they had like their final two years of high school education destroyed by the COVID ep epidemic. And they have all kinds of like stress issues. They, 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 they're not where they need to be in their reading and things, things like that. And it's, it's, it's like very difficult for them. But, you know, of course, everybody wants to like fight the culture war. Because, I mean, and Jason and I have t talked about this. When we do TIR shows about the culture war, everybody wants to watch it. And yeah. then everyone's like, but really, we want serious discussions on foreign policy. We Bullshit. do a serious show on foreign policy. Nobody wants to, nobody wants to hear me drone on for 30 minutes about, you know, Guinea-Bissau, right? I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> they, well, they want you to say it in a way they can understand, which is uh, America bad. Yeah. America bad, but that's not a generational thing because there's plenty yeah. of millennials and Gen Xers who are on the America bad train. Like, oh I yeah, think. everybody's on. It's it's easy to digest America bad. You don't need to have a lot of background knowledge anywhere. Like uh, Russia, Ukraine is real is a, is a perfect example, right? Um, that Tucker Carlson interview is like American schooling in a nutshell, right? How Putin just filibustered this whole history yeah, yeah, yeah. of. <laughs> <laughs> of of Russia, pre-Russia, Russia, and Tucker Carlson just stood there with that look while he just saw his mom blowing Santa Claus. And, <laughs> you know, and uh, I don't think a lot of people understood the history of those two, two places, right? Or even that landmass in general. I mean, yeah. See, sure. seeing, seeing the images that we're getting from, from Gaza... You don't really need to know about 1948 to know that it's a horrible thing to see dead children. Yep. Yeah. Just like Vietnam. Americans that lived through Vietnam, they don't they probably still can't find it on a map. But they know that those images they saw, their kids coming back, their family members coming back all fucked up, was enough for them to know, like, this ain't right. Yeah, totally. So... On that note, um, Tyler, will you be joining us in the champagne room? Yeah, why not? I sent you. I sent you the link for that, right? You did. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Gene, are you joining us in the champagne room? Yeah, I can join you in the champagne room for a little bit. Um, M. Toussaint will be joining us in the champagne room. Thank you guys so much for uh, hanging out with us, Gene. Thank you for jumping in, Tyler. Thank you for coming on the show. I hope I can have you back. I'd love to, man. This was a blast. I'm trying to have uh, a big black panel. Nice. Um, you gonna call we'll a big black this. panel? Maybe wow. we'll just call the show Big Black Panel in, in a couple weeks. Um, and uh, would love to have you as a part of the uh, Big Black Wait, Panel. Wait, who's on the Black Panel? I'm not telling anything. Sorry, just, man. Is that's Vaughn on the Black, on the black panel? panel to know. Is, is who? Is Vaughn on the Black Panel? <laughs> Vaughn will not be on the Big Black Panel. <laughs> to this day, Derek Vaughn is the biggest white shit starter on the internet. And I feel comfortable saying that. And I believe I've said that to his face, maybe. And if not, I will when I see him in Utah. Because it was him that started that whole ruckus 
with the late Greg Tate and me and Pascal over Afro pessimism. Varn instigated that. Do you remember that show, Gene? He was instigating. He instigated that whole thing. And Greg and Tate wrote back that. With his Sean King haircut. <laughs> That's back when he, <laughs> you put Sean King on the thumbnail. I did. And nobody noticed. And that and and after that show, Greg Tate wrote that goddamn article. Oh yeah, he did oh, write that Afro pessimism. And like, and he triggered what, what, him into writing an article. Was it in the Nation or something? It was. It was. I think it was in the Nation. He was very. Big, he was very yeah. defense. If, uh, oh, he did. He wrote this glowing, just loving review of Afro pessimism. Really? And I was like, God, yeah. I think it was one of the last things he wrote before he passed away. Oh yeah. And it was because of that show, and we went off on Frank Wilderson, and he said, <laughs> <laughs> "That's awesome." So Derek Varn started that whole thing. White people. White devils. Right? We coming for you, nigga. So thank you guys for checking this out. Uh, please, if you're already a patron, the link is up for you guys. If you're not a patron, uh, patreon.com slash presents for as little as $3 a month or $30 for the year. You can have access for the champagne room. Join us for movie nights. And you can make sure that we can continue to bring you this show. If you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, subscribe, and you have access to all the champagne rooms as well. Thank you so much, guys. We'll meet you in the champagne room. And we are out. I think. Hopefully. <laughs>